We normally think things exist the way they appear, that impermanent things are permanent, and that we can find happiness through trying to control the external world to satisfy our desires. It's a pretty bleak situation, and it's called samsara. Samsara is the agitated, dissatisfied, and confused state of mind most of us experience all the time, which results in the uncontrolled cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. Just as there is dark and light, if there is samsara, then there is nirvana. And that's the state of complete mental peace. Nirvana is not an external heaven or a paradise, but rather it's a state of mind. It's totally free of all limitations and no longer controlled by destructive emotions. Join us in looking more deeply at samsara and how we're caught in it. And nirvana and how we are liberated by it. Samsara and Nirvana. On the one hand, samsara or cyclic existence is suffering and its causes. On the other end of the spectrum, there's Nirvana. Complete freedom, complete liberation from that suffering and its causes. Our current situation is that we're in cyclic existence, in samsara. And where we want to go is nirvana, complete freedom. But there's no way that we can get there without an intention to do so, without a strong motivation. So before listening to the teachings, right now, generate a strong motivation in your own mind to learn as much as possible about both samsara, our current situation, and nirvana, where we want to go, in order to be able to achieve that freedom for the benefit of all sentient beings as quickly as possible. So maybe I'd like to explain a little bit more about to get a real idea of what samsara means, you know, uh, the depth of samsara, so that one can, f one can begin to feel compassion for oneself and a f feeling of what is the meaning of renunciation, you know, that, um, uh, yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm. The thought renouncing samsara. So we first have to know exactly what samsara means to generate this wish to overcome samsara. So samsara, what it really means. And uh, uh, there is one explanation uh, that includes we call three levels, you know, of suffering, three kinds of suffering. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to explain this first. Yeah, the first one is called suffering of pain. And that uh, includes all the ordinary pains, physical pains, sickness, uh, you know, hurt, and our uh, mental problems of uh, suffering of separation, you know, dissatisfaction, depression, anxiety, fear, worry. That's usually only that level of suffering that we are aware of, you know, in our daily life that we are trying to overcome. But samsaric suffering has much more to it than that, you know. Uh, the second level of samsara we call the suffering of change. And uh, the suffering of change is much more subtle and difficult to, to comprehend, you know. Uh, it's all about how uh, the pleasures that we seek in samsara, the temporary pleasures, are in fact all in the nature of suffering because they, they change into 
dissatisfaction and eventually pain. You know? Mm. Mm. So we say, although we call it pleasure, in fact, it's in the nature of suffering. Yeah? We give it the name pleasure, but somehow, when we analyze it, we can see, eventually always turns into suffering or misery. You know? uh, the third kind of suffering uh, that explains samsaric existence, you know, <coughs> is the, uh, um, we call all pervading suffering or pervasive suffering. Pervasive because it covers all of our existence, our body and our mind, you know, is in the nature of this all-pervasive suffering. So everything within our ordinary body and mind is a product, you know, uh, of suffering and creates more suffering. So it's in the nature of suffering. When we understand these levels of suffering, we can look at samsara and see the faults of samsaric existence. You know? That there is nothing within samsaric existence that gives us satisfaction or happiness or is uncontaminated. But if we meditate on it, we can start to develop disgust with samsaric suffering. Especially when we realize that we have the potential to be free. So, for Buddhists, samsara is but a way of looking at the world uh, that is associated with attachment and self-cherishing and the desire that things be as we wish them to be. And since um, this, this whole notion of the world being as we wish it to be since our wanting the world to remain uh, a certain way cannot be met, is always subject to failure because the true nature of the world is impermanent and changingness all the time, uh, those desires to keep it permanent will inevitably lead to suffering. The Buddha taught Four Noble Truths. There is suffering. There is a cause of suffering. There's a cessation of suffering. There's a path leading to the cessation of suffering. The Buddha said from his own experience, after he had meditated six years and performed these incredibly rigorous meditations, he said, I've discovered this truth. There's suffering. And I've also discovered that it's possible to end it. And so after he had taught for 45 years in India, Looking back on what he accomplished, he said, I've taught only two things, suffering and its end. Now, if you wanted to capture Buddhist doctrine as a whole, what you'd say and what you'd have to look at and all that you'd have to look at are those four noble truths. Okay, so if we take them one by one now. There is suffering, dukkha, the Buddha said. Mm. He said, what constitutes suffering is almost anything we can imagine. Uh, birth is suffering, death is suffering, aging is suffering, old age is suffering, pain, grief, lamentation is suffering. The second noble truth says there's a cause of suffering. There is desire, craving, uh, and this is the most palpable cause of our suffering but it's only the most palpable cause. We desire things to be permanent. We desire to get what we want. We desire to get away from what we don't want. And so that desire is one of the things that keeps uh, samsara in motion. The root cause is our own ignorance about the way in which we exist 
and all other things exist. We try to hold on to something's being permanent that is by its nature impermanent. That leads to frustration. Um, so ignorance is the basic cause of suffering. Uh, the optimistic part about Buddhism is that after showing us various methods for uh, eliminating the cause of suffering, uh, it offers, in the Third Noble Truth, uh, the end of suffering. And in Buddhist texts of the early school, that cessation is called nirvana. In teachings of the so-called later school, that end is called bodhi, or complete enlightenment. Mm. And this is the state that the Buddha himself attained. And attaining the cessation of suffering doesn't put someone in a different place, doesn't put them in a different body, doesn't put them in a different world. Uh, it changes their view. They give up the attachment to a self as a fixed, permanent existent. Changing that idea, giving up that idea, abandoning that idea, they find themselves with a new view of things. And that new view of the world is what nirvana is. It's not something else. It's not something apart from us. We have that potential within us to see it that way. If our ignorance is what causes suffering, then our own insight and our own wisdom is what will cause it to cease. So nirvana, as the third noble truth, is held out as, as the, uh, the possible end. It is an end to suffering. And such a thing exists. The fourth noble truth says there is a path leading to the cessation of suffering. And that path provides a means for us to realize directly the end of suffering. So that you yourself can see, you know, try it on, try the method on, see what, whether it's beneficial or not. And if it is, then keep practicing it. Now, this puts the responsibility for our practicing all of these various paths, but primarily the responsibility for gaining insight right on our shoulders. It's it's not anywhere else. Uh, we have the ability to not only locate the cause, the root cause of suffering, but to eliminate it. We have that responsibility ourselves. It's not to be found in the outside world. It's not put uh, in the hands of anyone else, any deity or any guru, any teacher. It is totally up to us. The Buddha himself said in um, a scripture that were it up to me, then samsara would be empty. If I could do it for you, samsara would be empty. But I can only show you the way. You yourself have to practice. You yourself have to try it out. You yourself have to investigate. You yourself have to sit on that cushion and meditate. So, in any case, the point is that when we think about liberation, uh, we should not have the notion that it exists outside somewhere as a kind of a physical plane or physical uh, uh, domain. Rather, liberation has to be understood uh, in terms of 
one's own quality of mind or state of mind. And um, uh, we spoke about the presence of natural nirvana, the natural purity in all of us, which serves as the basis. And on that basis, when all the obscurations and the afflictions are eliminated, that is the true uh, nirvana, that's the true liberation. And when you go deeper in your understanding of the nature of um, uh, liberation or moksha, then we can understand it in terms of the, the ultimate nature of one's own mind. The ultimate nature of one's own mind at a stage when all the afflictions are eliminated, that is tr the liberation, that is moksha. So we find that actually in the final analysis, it is our ignorance and fundamental uh, misconception of the ultimate nature of reality that lies at the root of our uh, samsaric existence, that lies at the root of our unenlightened existence. Therefore, if it is the ignorance and misconception of the fundamental nature of reality that creates the unenlightened existence, that means it is by cultivating the correct insight into the true nature of reality which will begin the process of undoing this unenlightened existence, which will begin the process of liberation. Therefore, um, as the Tibetan's masters say, that um, when in ignorant state we are in the samsara, when, um, when, uh, when um, uh, insight or when the knowledge is uh, developed, um, generated, then we are liberated. So this samsara and nirvana uh, is, is uh, distinguished on the basis of whether we are in the state of ignorance or whether in the, we are in the state of knowledge. And so what we find here is that the, the ultimate antidote for eliminating the fundamental ignorance, which is the root of cyclic existence, is the wisdom realizing emptiness, wis wisdom cognizing emptiness. And, and the, the emptiness, the ultimate nature of that mind, when all the obscurations have been eliminated, that emptiness of mind is a qual that that quality of mind is the nirvana. That's the final nirvana. So therefore, we can say that um, that which uh, causes us to be caught in uh, unenlightened exist existence uh, uh, relates to our ignorance of the fundamental nature of reality emptiness. So from the Buddhist point of view, this would be explained in terms of, uh, in, in the following way, that in the physical world, there is an ever-present continuum at the subtlemost level of a physical continuum. Uh, we spoke about this earlier, which is space particles. And then when it interacts, comes into contact with sentient beings, karma, karma acts as a condition, which then give rise to various permutations of the physical reality uh, so that eventually a macroscopic world comes into being that can actually have direct effect upon sentient beings' experience of pain and pleasure, happiness and suffering. So it is on these lines that the Buddhists would explain uh, the whole uh, evolution and dissolution of universe. This is very uh, clear if you look at the traditional Buddhist teachings on the 12 links of dependent origination which gives the, the picture of the process of evolution um, within the cycle of existence. Uh, we find that the, the individual's existence in cycle of existence, um, samsara, unenlightened existence, is explained in terms of this 12 interlocking chain. Um, um, and here it is very clear that there is no concept of there being some kind of central unifying figure which is like the kind of the, the creator of the everything, and then everything sort of revolves around it. Rather, the whole evolution is explained in terms of uh, interlocking, interlocking uh, 12 sets of 12 chains. So that the point of interlocking uh, is, is that when, for example, uh, one cycle of 12 links is in progress, before that entire cycle finishes, another cycle is already set in motion. So that while, for example, when you are already experiencing the consequences within one, twelve chains, already uh, ignorance and the karmic um, actions and so on, uh, which is part of another cycle, is already set in motion. So in the teachings on the twelve links, the Buddha teaches us that uh, 
uh, the two sets of uh, 12 um, links, um, a, a cycle of a chain of 12 links. One is the, the, the evolution or within the uh, evolution of an individual within the unenlightened existence, starting from ignorance, karmic uh, volitional acts, consciousness, and so on. Then he also explains to us another set, another cycle, where the cycle is reversed, which then gives us the reversal process where the, cycle, the process of enlightenment is explained. So by uh, eliminating, um, uh, by bringing to an end uh, ignorance, then the volitional acts are prevented. By preventing volitional acts, consciousness is prevented and so on. So the reversal process of uh, unenlightened ex existence is also explained. So I think the 12 links is a fantastic teaching in terms of getting some fresh respect for the law of cause and effect. Because if you really think that each moment of ignorance is going to produce or will possibly produce a cause for one's next rebirth in samsara, that's pretty heavy. That's pretty scary. Um, it's going to make, it, I found for myself that it definitely made, made me respect a little bit more my choices and my actions. And I think the other, the other thing, of course, for, especially for, for Westerners, I think that the picture of the Twelve Links is kind of powerful because, of course, it all begins, you know, the picture with a little old, usually it's a little old lady or a little old man with their stick, you know, because they're blind. And I think that's very challenging because we like to think we're in control of our lives and that we're somehow this powerful, dynamic being walking through the landscape that we have chosen, making decisions and, you know, we're in the driving seat and, we, and we're, we're kind of successful at that. And then you see this picture, you think, I'm not that. that's some Tibetan thing, you know. And then, of course, when you really think about ignorance and how it's essentially leading us by the nose um, into this... Mm, this mud of harming ourselves and others and continued dissatisfaction, then yeah, we are pretty much like the little blind old lady, you know, tottering towards a precipice, completely unknowing what, um, what her steps are leading towards. So I think that it's, it's a very helpful image. But again, the 12 links can really help you to see that that actually is a direct benefit that you are giving yourself and a direct benefit that you're giving to others because every moment that you're consciously choosing not to act out of, um, out of strong ignorance is a moment towards your enlightenment and a moment therefore to be able to benefit others. And, that, and every moment you think of that of course loosens that sense of I'm at the center of the world, you know, you exist for me. And it's like, well, no, <laughs> I don't think that's true. <laughs> and, you know, and actually I'm just, you know, existing independence upon other beings, independence upon um, causes and effects, independence, of course, upon um, this label, me. So I think that's another, another way in which we can really use the 12 links to give us a, not only a sort of a more enjoyable time in our daily life through remembering interdependence but of course also you know trying to use that as a way to get closer to some understanding of of selflessness and some you know the, because selflessness and interdependence are the two sides of the same coin aren't they so I think for all of those reasons very helpful practice to try to reflect upon in fact I must do it more <laughs>